not long after the virus was identified, uh, my partner, Doug Jackson, with whom I'd been for about five years at that point, had a younger brother just graduating from college. And in the summer of 1985, he had lost about 35 pounds, and the apartment he was sharing with his friends in Washington, could, they could no longer care for him, and he, he either was going to return to his parents' home outside Atlanta, which he did not want to do, or he had come to San Francisco and live with us. We had an extra bedroom, we had an extra bath. Of course, the best cutting edge medical care and research was here. We didn't have an AIDS diagnosis at the end of the summer, but we certainly feared what it was. So by Thanksgiving of 1985, Stuart came to live with us, and it was a very quick and cruel death for Stuart. Uh, he died by the 1st of March, so it was really just a few short months. He was receiving what was then a 21-day drip treatment for pneumocystis uh, pneumonia, and only after the fact of his death did we realize that he was riddled with KS legions internally from his throat all the way to his anus. And so that was life-changing for both Doug, his family, and me. Uh, it's one thing to be living in the midst of an epidemic, but when it finally knocks on your door, it changes everything. It was at that point that Doug and I realized we needed to get tested. And we learned that Doug was positive and that I was negative. And he was well for many years, but became ill toward the end of 1989, early 1990. He could no longer continue going to work. And then Doug died in June of 1990. Before we knew that it was a virus, before we knew how the virus was spread, everything and anything was considered a potential cause. It did seem as though there were certain parts of San Francisco that were being impacted more quickly and more profoundly than others. And many of those neighborhoods were south of market. Many of them represented men from the leather community and it was suspected it might be because of certain sexual practices, because of poppers, because of who knows what, but it was happening first south of market. There certainly are social dynamics that are common throughout subsets of the dominant culture, and I think Bob Dylan had a line in a song once that made the point that outlaws have to have a very strict set of laws for themselves because they're living outside the law. So when there is a minority within a minority, there's a immediate sense that the community must trust each other, must respect each other, must sustain each other because otherwise the demise is always right in front of us. And I think the leather community instinctively knew that and lived it and showed us how it's done. It was a desperate time. People had to do, it was triage. And either you stepped up and did something to stop the bleeding or we were all gonna die. So whether it was a sense in the history of knowing that we're outlaws and we're outlaws among outlaws that we have to step up, but all that aside, we were dying. There was no one there to help us. No one expressed any concern. The message we were getting from the president on down was, we'll all be better off if you die. So this community rose to the occasion. And the community had a history of taking care of each other in the old biker communities uh, where there would be bike runs on weekends, gay men would get together. And they traditionally had beer bus, they traditionally had fundraisers. They raised money because members would get into accidents, members would fall ill, and it was a community that already knew how to care for itself. 
So this quickly translated into care for those who were suffering from what was first referred to as GRID, gay-related immunodeficiency, before it became uh, acquired immune deficiency virus uh, syndrome. And from that, by 1982, the AIDS Emergency Fund was born. The AIDS Foundation certainly followed quickly and was a much more broader-based effort. And the project in form was put together by 1985 to help, once the virus was identified, to help gay men through the labyrinth of potential and experimental treatments giving them information that they could read so they get better informed and know this might be safe, what the risks were of that. But before any of that was the AIDS Emergency Fund and was the engagement of the leather community. Well, I might suggest that young people less informed of what happened and how it happened become informed, read, go online, find out what you can learn the history, because there's a lot of pride to be taken from that history. It was a devastating time. It was not unlike time of war, and we were all soldiers in that battle. But there were a lot of heroes, and a lot of the infrastructure of 30 years ago, 35 years ago, exists today. And so, for example, raising money for the AIDS Emergency Fund, for Breast Cancer Emergency Fund, for other community-based nonprofits. It's going on today. So again, get informed and take pride in what you learn.